We continue now with Peter Jennings reporting. We're gonna need a pot of gold. Magic paper. Wallpaper. Yes, Somewhere in the Pacific Northwest, a cash machine is under construction. The supplies are simple and cheap. $50 for two rolls of mylar. <laughs> Very efficient, dude. <laughs> $150 for staples, scissors, a and a fan. What kind of pizza you get today? $20 for a large pizza with everything on it. And $1,500 for six sodium halide lights. Total cost $1,720. A meager investment if you consider that every month and a half this room will produce six pounds of high-grade, homegrown marijuana, which can be sold for $26,400. At the end of the year, this room will produce at least $200,000 in tax-free income. I don't have any money. There's some good money, and it's out there, and it's, if I don't do it, someone else is going to do it, and that's how I feel about that. And this is just one grow room. Imagine the whole country. In the past, the government has estimated that it eradicates 10, maybe 20% of the marijuana produced in the United States. Using that as a guide, Americans are producing marijuana worth somewhere between 20 and $40 billion every year. We are talking about what may be the largest cash crop in America. We started in the Northwest because it is the regional capital of indoor marijuana growing. The president of the Washington State Narcotics Officers Association is Roger Lake. I supervise a drug task force and I have six detectives. We could work indoor marijuana grows eight hours a day, every day of the year. There's that much growth here? Yes. Do you know how much? Do you have some estimate of how many people are growing? I don't know. I, I, just, I just know that there are so many uh, multiple conspirators in marijuana grows um, that we can't deal with them. I'm gonna hit this jump right here. By Roger Lake's definition, these are marijuana conspirators. A group of friends who play by day and grow by night. They're all in their early to mid twenties, some already with families. No one grows more than 99 plants because growers know that if they're caught with a hundred or more, they face severe mandatory federal prison sentences. We set out to understand how and why these young entrepreneurs came together to grow marijuana. According to the law, they are joined in a criminal enterprise. On a show of hands, how many of you in it are in it for the money? I can't say I'm not, because it is part of it. The money's good. I don't like the company. From the shadows, six out of nine raised their hands. You can make as good of a living as you care to make. Yeah, so there's getting by, and then there's huge. It's yeah, I plan on making around thirty-five, forty thousand dollars this month. This month? This month. Thirty-five or forty thousand yeah, dollars this month. About nine and a half pounds that I remind. Yeah. And I am only. Do any of the rest of you make that kind of money? I don't make that kind of money. I, I maybe double that in a year. So you can make seventy thousand dollars a year. Hundred thousand I mean, minus oh. costs. This enables you to be different? Absolutely. It uh -huh. allows you to step away. It allows you to step back and, and, and enjoy your life. And take we'll your call him Frank. He created the group. He grew up. Uh, every three weeks, I harvest approximately two pounds, ideally. And the wholesale price on two pounds would be about $8,000. So 8000 every three weeks is uh, close to $100,000 a year. How much time do you, do you spend worrying about the law. The first time that I got busted, I hadn't even gone to my court date, and I'd already rented another house and had set up in there, because it's the only, when you're, when you're a busted grower, really your only option is to set up another operation in order to afford your legal fees and court fines and everything else. It's just the obvious thing to do. Eventually, Frank was busted a second time, and he was looking at 15 years in prison. But he had a good lawyer, and he ended up serving only 26 days in jail which he put to very good use. Jail was a very interesting experience for me. It was in that meditative environment that I came up with the idea that I needed more people to help me grow the amount of pot that I wanted to grow. So I came up with the idea of, of creating a co-op and just encouraging people to grow themselves instead of having me try and supply everybody. When he got out of jail, Frank went looking for associates. 
Using his own marijuana stock, he offered free cuttings and his own expertise to several people he trusted. One person he involved we'll call Mary. Uh, my friend introduced me to Frank. He just came over to my house one night to meet me and look at my house and see if it was a decent house for that kind of operation. And he was, um, Frank was just really excited that um, a girl wanted to do it. And he was happy to help. He was like, he was so much help. Taught me everything I know, pretty much. Mary, like Frank, grew up in California. She first smoked marijuana with her mother when she was 15. In her house, marijuana was a family value. When we were kids, my parents would have dinner parties and they'd have friends over. And after dinner, they'd all sit around the couch and they'd smoke like the cigarette that smelled funny. And they'd always call us in to, to entertain them. I remember I'd always make them laugh really hard and I thought it was really funny and cool, but later on I figured out they were high. <laughs> Mary wouldn't let us photograph her grow room. Instead, she provided us with this tape. Basically, the way I figure out how much you make is by how many lights you have. I have five lights in the, in the uh, bud room, so, you know, I'm expecting between 15 and 20 grand over the next month, and yes, I'm making too much money for what I do, but it's not wrong. It's not hurting anybody, you know. How many of you have parents who you know use marijuana? 90% of you. You, yes. Eric? When I was little, my dad was growing marijuana, and I'd seen it. I didn't really know what marijuana was back then. I've just seen the plants. Dad was downstairs in the garage or something. Eric's father grew marijuana to smoke. Eric and his wife, Tracy, began growing marijuana a year and a half ago for the money. This room, which he started building with his friend just four hours ago, will soon be filled with plants from some of Frank's cuttings. Eric and Tracy say that growing marijuana gives them time as well as money. Get up in the morning with my boy. I um, help my other boy get off to school. I might boat, snowboard, uh, I kind of enjoy the day. Some days I have my days. I always do what I want every day. Our kid goes to school and he's in swimming lessons and, you know, we grocery shop and we, we you know, people come over and they hang out and... You know, the regular stuff that everyone does, we, but we don't go to work. Last year, my first year, I made $64,000. Um, and then now I figure to make a couple hundred thousand. You're a real honest, honest to God marijuana entrepreneur. The money's great. These are money trees. I don't know whoever said money didn't grow on trees. They don't know what trees to look at. In just a few short years, Frank says he's taught 50 to 100 people how to grow and he's helped them get started with cuttings from his own plants. Frank is very deliberate in subverting the marijuana laws, which he believes to be wrong. The police consider Frank and other growers criminals, but it is not easy to catch them. Well, you had the amperage hooked up, you had the vents hooked up, you had the lights there. You had what the, lights? What, you, am, what, what are you talking about? You had halide lights back there. No, I didn't. Okay. You also On the day we were with them, the local drug task force had a hard time of it. No, we, we talked about it. We talked about it then. But I don't see any evidence of that, so we'll be out of your way. All right? Okay. Thanks a lot right, for thanks, letting us okay. look around. Okay. Roger Lake often says that there is at least one grower on every block in some parts of western Washington. He says that 90% are never caught. Still, he goes after them. For one thing, seizing their assets keeps his department going. Several people have told me that you like to make marijuana bus because you get good cars. And you keep driving those cars around. There's some truth to that, yes. If we don't... Uh, seize real, uh, real property or personal property, we don't have any money to operate. Our task force is, is funded by a federal grant. The federal grant covers 75% of the salaries for the detectives. The 25% remaining and our day-to-day -day operating budget comes from asset forfeiture. We talked to a group of growers, all in their 20s who give the impression of being very cohesive, very close, very supportive of one another, who think what they have in common is the plant, mm -hmm. for whatever reasons, and their resistance to you. We've worked large marijuana conspiracies. Um, upwards of 20 people involved, five different uh, places where they're growing marijuana, into the uh, millions of dollars of assets, 
and that will be a close-knit group. Is it fair to say that they're a step ahead of you, or are you a step ahead of them? <clears throat> they're a step ahead of us, All probably uh, two or three steps ahead of us. The reason we're out here is we got some information. Apparently, what brought them here today was a false lead. Might be manufacturing marijuana. Excuse we get in. Well, the first time you get busted for marijuana, what happens to you? Normally, what happens first time offender for a marijuana grower? This isn't somebody that's just just smoking a joint. This is someone that's growing marijuana to distribute, sell, avoid income tax, avoid everything, and sell to, to usually youth. Um, they'll get community service. Second time? Uh, second time, they might get three to seven days. Third time? I don't know. It's just not enough. So I think you're telling me, Mr. Lake, that if I wanted to grow marijuana, I could move to your neighborhood and operate pretty much with impunity. Yes. And make a lot of money in the process. Yes. And you'd never really bother <clears throat> me. I'd try to, but no, uh, the reality is no, we probably wouldn't catch you, but you would be living a miserable existence. Frank says his life is anything but miserable. This is a trim party. Today, Frank has invited members of his group to help him harvest an $8,000 crop. It's just pretty simple. It's, you just cut the plants down, trim the plants up, hang them up to dry, bag them up, sell it. I sell it to my good friends, they sell it to their good friends, they sell it to their good friends, and that's the end of it. How do you think you're going to be, uh, Dave, when you're 50? I'm going to be growing pot with my kids, and who knows what's going to happen. Are any of you at all concerned about, embarrassed about, that you live outside the mainstream because you do indulge in something which is criminal? You know, I've gotten along with so many grandparents and people that just think I'm a great person, but the one word of me saying, I'm, I grow marijuana, I'd be a, a criminal. I mean, here you're all growers. It enables you to all live lives in which you don't have to work at real jobs like millions of other Americans. I work a job. And I wonder if you ever think about life in any other different, in any other way. Show me the harm. Show me the harm. That what's just the makes harm? it illegal. Is it illegal. Why am I a danger to society? <laughs> that's, that's the joke. And as long as the money's so good and the risk so small, growing marijuana will continue to attract more and more people, as we'll see in a moment. Peter Jennings reporting. Pot of Gold will continue. Pot of Gold. The truth about marijuana is that you never know who's growing it. You're listening to the Rush Limbaugh Show, and here's a couple that lives in the Midwest. They live in a well-ordered suburb in a medium-sized town, and they describe themselves as Rush Limbaugh Republicans. Now you have a story out there. Researchers say that uh, marijuana has great uses in medical applications. I'm surprised we haven't heard any potheads. Have you heard many potheads? Bob and Wendy, as we'll call them, say they don't like potheads, and they are not marijuana smokers. But they do have a secret. They're growing marijuana in their basement. If your neighbors knew you were growing marijuana, would they be surprised? Absolutely. And they'd be shocked. On the other hand, how do you know they're not? We don't. Is, is it fair to say that uh, you might not fit what some people regard as the popular notion of the marijuana grower? I don't think I fit, no. We're your neighbors. You know, we're kind of... Main Street, uh, USA Apple Pie, Mom and Pop. We're mowing our lawn, uh, loan you our rake or shovel. We pay taxes, we go to church, we have jobs, we, you know, we like nice things. We're not hippies. See how the roots hit the bottom and they're starting to grow up the side to the top? And that's way, way overdue. Bob and Wendy are growing marijuana for the money. But after two years, they have yet to cover their expenses. So now they're trying to improve their crop. Hello. The object of this tape is to demonstrate an easy-to-follow video form. Marijuana is becoming more and more important to Bob because he thinks his regular job is in jeopardy. 
the company I work for is looking at a major downsizing. And uh, it's very possible I could be caught up in this if this can sustain us between jobs or until I find suitable employment or stop a foreclosure on a house. Uh, this could be an absolute godsend in our lives. This room produces about four pounds every two weeks. Am I overstating it when I say that you're afraid of your economic future and that marijuana is the answer for you? We hope that it will be. It hasn't been yet, but we think it will be. Well, how about the notion that you are leading a criminal life? I don't like that. We're not criminals. You are criminals. I can't say that we've ever sat down together and said, let's discuss, gee, you know, do you realize we're, we're living outside of the law or that we're criminals? I've never viewed it as that, and maybe because I'm caught up in the growing and the, the aspect or the prospect of growing something that I can make money with. Many different people grow marijuana. Uh, the reason is always the same, uh, that it's lucrative. Jeff Stewart used to grow marijuana, and he knows there can be consequences. In 1990, Stewart was arrested for growing marijuana, and because he was tried and convicted in federal court, he served four years and four months. Today, he works for a lobby group in Washington dedicated to sentencing reform. Stewart understands why Bob and Wendy are doing what they're doing. Suddenly, here's a stream of income. And uh, most people uh, confronted with a stream of income are going to think twice about uh, walking away from it. Uh, most of the people that I encountered in the federal prison system were marijuana growers that had grown and grown and grown until they had been apprehended. But they uh, are probably a minority among marijuana growers. The others are still growing and haven't been apprehended. Last fall, Bob and Wendy decided they would risk some of their modest savings in search of better marijuana seeds. So they invested in a trip to Holland. Every year, the American magazine High Times, a journal dedicated to the appreciation of marijuana, holds a marijuana trade fair here. They call it the Cannabis Cup. You say, I love the Cannabis Cup. Cannabis cat. Why rhino? Why rhino? What was it like? What was the trip like, man? Um, <laughs> there was a bunch of hippies. I'd, I'd never been around that many people like that before. I mean, we just kind of stayed to ourselves and looked around and... I, I think we uh, stuck out there. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, we were kind of... From another people. planet, I think. In fact, Bob and Wendy didn't stand out that much at all. There were many others here like them from all over the world, interested in learning more about marijuana. Let me ask you this one, What are you selling here? What's your deal? They come to the Netherlands because authorities here tolerate marijuana, and it's a $4 billion a year industry. We talked to a Dutch seed seller, Daniel Kohn, who told us the seed business is booming. It's better than selling diamonds. It's better than selling cocaine. It's better than selling whatever. There, the profit margin is so nice. You can make it yourself just because you have it and you're the only place to get it, they come to get it. People come here to learn what they can from the Dutch masters about improving their techniques. If I tell people how they can get a good yield with only four plants, this man, who goes by the name Vernard, is respected as one of Amsterdam's best. He is one of the people responsible for making Amsterdam the marijuana mecca it is today. Vernard has his own marijuana business, and it's impressive. It's a combination seed store, a marijuana school, this is one of the classes, a marijuana nursery, and a coffee house where you can sample different varieties of marijuana from Vernard's battery-powered pipe. If you like what you inhale, the seeds are for sale out front. Four packs of haze. Four packs of haze. Most of the visitors here were Americans, and for them, these were especially high times. Only a few weeks earlier, voters in two states, California and Arizona, Pass propositions legalizing the use of marijuana by anyone with a doctor's recommendation. Californian Dennis Perone, the man in the light shirt there with the tie, is one of the people responsible for leading the campaign. 
We found Perón here in Amsterdam, explaining to Bernard his strategy for the legalization of marijuana. Essentially, you're only going to get these people to agree about marijuana as medicine. Yeah. But if you think about marijuana, how do we use it and why we use it, it is a medicinal reason. Mm. And so for that reason, I believe that all marijuana use is medical. Perone's critics believe that his campaign for medical marijuana is just a first step towards his ultimate goal of complete legalization. What you have to do is build a coalition of senior citizens, of housewives and professionals and doctors and lawyers and nurses. Mm -hmm. You know, politics is illusions. Right. Shadows on the wall. It's pictures, it's, it's photos, it's an AP wire. Right. And uh, so I've not created an illusion, but I've articulated what marijuana, I've changed the face from a long hair hippie to Hazel Rogers. Mm -mm. Hazel Rogers is a 77-year-old Californian who uses marijuana to treat her glaucoma. Her picture has appeared in numerous magazines and newspapers as a symbol of marijuana's newfound medicinal value. And, uh, it's kind of like a, I don't know, like a fantasy story mm -hmm. that I could do something in the middle of the war on drugs like that and uh, do it for three and a half years and uh, and get away with it. <laughs> While Perone explained how he was changing the way Americans think about marijuana, Bob and Wendy from the Midwest walked in the front door shopping for seeds. So this is this is close to Big Bud? Yeah. Now somebody here last night said everything that grows outdoor will grow fine indoor too, and I understand it's just the opposite. It's uh, outdoor varieties have to be outdoor. You met Werner. Very briefly, yes. Are you Bernard? Yeah. Oh, very nice to meet you. I read your articles and very good. I came 4,000 miles to learn everything I could. So. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I wanted to uh, get as much growing information from him as I could. And uh, he was very quick to, to uh, insist we, we indulge or sample some of his finest. We're not smokers. I didn't get but three more questions in before I had to go sit down and eventually go lay down. It makes it a little better. Before they left, Bob and Wendy bought two varieties of seeds from Bernard. As it turns out, if Bob and Wendy had known, they didn't have to come all this way. Several overseas companies have sites on the internet now and will send seeds directly through the mail to the U.S. Because receiving seeds or marijuana in the mail is illegal, the companies promise confidentiality. But we obtained this list from one of them showing where their orders were sent. In a four-month period in 1995, 5,198 seeds were sent to 201 American towns and cities in 40 states. Meanwhile, Bob and Wendy were smuggling the old-fashioned way. During their week-long stay in Amsterdam, they bought 60 seeds for $235. We scared? Very, uh, very. When they returned to the United States, Bob and Wendy had a scare. A 90-minute strip search at customs. They were badly shaken, but customs officers failed to find their seeds. Jeff Stewart remembers it's not a life he would like to live again. There's a lot of paranoia, a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. People are lured into it because they think it's quick and it's easy money, and it may be. But a lot comes with that. It's just somehow like a law of physics. You don't get a lot of money without consequences, even if you win the lottery. Has becoming growers isolated you a little bit? A little bit. It, at times, it can dictate, you know, when you can turn a light on and when you can't. There's a big risk. 
And we know that, but we're, you know, we don't really have a lot of company. And they spend a lot of time in their basement caring for their new plants. Their crop was smaller than they had hoped. Many of the seeds from Vernard had failed to sprout. Still, Bob and Wendy were plunging ahead and they were still hopeful. So if, uh, if all went extremely well, your trip to Amsterdam would result in you having 60,000 tax-free dollars you never had before? Possibly, yes. Yes, there's no guarantee of nothing. It's a big crapshoot. It's a lot of money. Yes, it yeah. is. And mm -hmm. we refer to them as the money trees. It's a term of endearment. Uh, yes, that's what we call them, the money trees. We're, we're hoping that as these grow, there'll be $100 bills stuck all over these. And that somehow, maybe we can build a brighter future out of this. Peter Jennings reporting. Pot of Gold will continue in a moment. ABC Late Night tonight. On Nightline, the latest trouble. These the engineers of the Pontiac Grand Am. Pot of Gold continues. We are over southern Georgia with a state-sponsored drug task force. We came down here just when this year's outdoor marijuana was ready to be harvested. It didn't surprise us when the pilots spotted something and started to circle back. But when we landed, what surprised us was how marijuana is changing rural farm communities. When planted outdoors, marijuana can grow 10 or 12 feet high. The plants here were near maturity. They were tied down to the ground to prevent them from being too easily seen. 151. There were several hundred plants here, and this seemed like it was a big day for the local police. Here, you to squat down. That's the county sheriff, Bucky Hayes, on the left, and the local town's police chief, Jimmy Carter, posing with a marijuana plant for a souvenir photograph. Let me get a couple more. It looked to us like a very strong case. A working irrigation line ran from the marijuana to a farmhouse spigot. Somebody we thought was clearly in trouble. But there was something about the arrest. It all seemed more like a reunion of old friends than a big drug bust. Certainly the farmer, Teddy Boatwright, never seemed to act as if he were in real trouble. Anything up on cigarette lighter? I might need it later on. <laughs> After Boatwright was released on bond, he talked pretty candidly to us about the role that marijuana plays in farm life here. It's been here since the early 70s. I think back then it was mostly just you had these few guys that smoked it. And uh, nowadays it's got to where it's, uh, it's a supplement for uh, a lot of people's income. And I know a lot of your businesses in town don't mind taking the money. All the people in this story live in Bacon County, Georgia. The county seat is Alma, about 10,000 people. We learned pretty quickly that a lot of people in Bacon County were growing at least some marijuana. Not to get rich, just to get by. Almost every farmer around here is struggling trying to make ends meet. And uh, basically it's because of the high price of equipment and the uh, operating expense. Well, we could, we could, could just quit and then Where? I reckon just <laughs> draw welfare. Teddy lives on the farm with his parents, Tuck and Margie. We could, we could apply for welfare, really because we make less than $10,000 a year, we could get a welfare check. But I got a little too much pride for that. Luther Taylor used to be an Alma policeman. Two years ago, Mr. Taylor found out his own son had planted some marijuana. Did you call the sheriff? My wife, me and my wife did, yes, sir. Why'd you do that? I didn't believe in it at that time. I didn't think it was right for farmers to go to still. But uh, the way the economy is right now, I wouldn't turn a man in if I walked by a field and see it. 
Now, you're having financial difficulties yes, at the sir. moment, are you? Yes, sir. Reason enough to grow marijuana? Yes, sir. So you would now grow? Yes, sir, I would. It's illegal. I know that. You used to be a policeman. I know that. Like I say, two or three years ago, I didn't feel that way. But now I do. I honestly do. A few years ago, Gordon Taylor was in a tight spot, and so he grew some marijuana. He pointed out to us that marijuana was the most profitable crop he could plant. Tell me the value of marijuana as a crop. As a crop. Uh, dollar and cents is per plant. Uh, you could generate one pound of marijuana off of a plant. And you could uh, sell that today anywhere for $2,500, that one plant. How's that compared to corn? Oh, it's a blow away. It would take you several acres. You would, you, your profit off of corn right now might be $50 an acre. That one plant of marijuana turned you $2,500 with a, a $10 input. That's the only commodity that a farmer's got in South Georgia that he puts price on. There's no problem putting our price on marijuana. That's thunder we're hearing, of course, but it seems to pretty much reflect the difference between the marijuana price and the corn price. There's a lot of difference. There's a lot of difference. But Gordon, there's one big difference between corn and marijuana. One's legal, one isn't. That's correct. So? I, I don't worry about the illegal part. Not, I, I, you know, illegal part, there's, there's certain chances every fella takes in life. And you just got to decide what chances you'll take. Not long ago, there was a man who took Bacon County's marijuana farmers head on. From 1987 to 1993, Chief Deputy Sheriff Larry Tanner went on an anti-marijuana crusade. His own videotapes document how well he did. We didn't plant this dope. Somebody else planted it. Send this guy to jail. Thank you. Tanner employed all the techniques of big city drug cops. People were enticed with reward money to inform on their friends and relatives. He exploited seizure laws. Anything used by a farmer to harvest or transport marijuana, like a barn or a car, he confiscated. When the word went out that Bacon County was a dangerous place to buy marijuana, Tanner took down all the signs that marked the county line, and dealers got busted when they didn't know where they were. The result of all these asset seizures was a much more modern sheriff's office. Five years after I started at the Sheriff's Department, we had all brand new cars. We had four wheelers. We had a computer. Uh, we had bought copy machines, fax machines. Uh, none of this stuff was available in our department when I started. All this from the money from seized assets of people who were in the marijuana business. And then there began a campaign against you. Yeah, that's when I, when I qualified to run for sheriff and uh, uh, these dealers that I was putting a hurt on them. The money people uh, decided that uh, they didn't need me in that office, and they orchestrated a plan to get rid of me. Uh, I may be wrong about the guy, but I don't like him. I never have liked him. Gerald Anderson was one of those farmers growing marijuana who wanted to get rid of Larry Tanner. He painted a message for Tanner and his chief investigator, Donald, on the roof of his barn. Suck this, Larry and Donald, it reads. Unfortunately for Anderson, when a drug task force pilot read it from the air, he also noticed a few hundred of Anderson's marijuana plants growing nearby. Pretty overt gesture from marijuana grower, right? Stupid, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you know. You don't draw attention to yourself if, you draw, if you're growing marijuana right next to it, you know. But Anderson was just fined and put on probation. He and other farmers would have the last laugh in Bacon County. When Larry Tanner announced his intention to run for sheriff, they met to organize against him. Yeah, there was a couple meetings like that I went to. I'd rather not say where, 
and they was pretty good crowds. Talked about uh, who they wanted support for a sheriff. And uh, there were probably 45 people there. That's when they got serious about Mr. Bucky, getting behind Mr. Bucky. Mr. Bucky is Bucky Hayes, and he had two things going for him with the farmers who grew marijuana. For one thing, he was a farmer. For another, his little brother, Timer Hayes, was a known marijuana grower. A lot of people here think that when they were voting for Bucky Hayes for sheriff, they were voting for a man who was going to go easier on marijuana growers than the former deputy sheriff, Larry Tanner, did, who you're running against. What do you say about that? Oh, well, I, I say I made no promises to anybody that I would be easier on anything, marijuana or whatever. Did you think at the time that Tanner was too hard on the growers? Oh, uh, what? That, that's one area there that I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to skip because I just. Uh, and why would you want to skip it? I just am. It may be that Sheriff Hayes doesn't think he can answer that question fairly because one of the people who got busted was Hayes' own brother, Timer. They found 1,700 plants on his property and in his house just two weeks before the election. Did you know Timer was growing? Mm, not for sure. I've never seen it. He lived just down the road? Yes, sir. He lived approximately two miles from me. He had 1,700 plants? Yes, sir. You never knew they were there? No, sir. Larry Tanner posed for the Alma paper with Timer Hayes confiscated marijuana, but he had seriously misread the people's sentiments on his get tough policy and the publicity backfired. Today, Tanner says the state task force scheduled the bust and didn't tell him. The timing on that bust, and I knew it when it happened, it was bad for me. It would look like that it was timed just before the election to help me. People don't like that. In the summer of 1992, the people of Bacon County overwhelmingly elected Bucky Hayes. Today, Larry Tanner sells used mobile homes. This is a powerful message. Oh, yeah. In Bacon County uh -huh. that 40 or 50, 45 growers can sit together and say that the deputy sheriff's too tough and therefore we don't want him a sheriff. Right. Is that a fair summation? Mm -hmm. There was a district attorney, a good friend of mine, always feel like he was, told me one time that uh, you can only police people to the point that they want to be policed. After you were defeated, mm -hmm. was Bacon County an easier place for marijuana growers to do business? Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Uh, they knew that, that nobody would be as aggressive as I was. Why was Larry Tanner able to find so many more growers than you've been able to? Mm -hmm. I couldn't answer that either. Well, I don't know where he had better informants or Or what, what the problem is. And how tough were you on marijuana growers after you were elected sheriff? Oh. Or shall I tell you? Tell me. Well, for a year and a half, from January 93, when you came into office until July 9... I showed the sheriff the statistics given to us by the state's drug task force. In each of the two years prior to Hayes taking office, there had been more than a million dollars worth of marijuana seized in Bacon County. I then showed the sheriff the statistics for his first year in office, 1993. And here is Bacon County in the year after your elected sheriff. Mm -hmm. Zero. I mean, it's not much of a compliment to a law enforcement officer, is it? Not much. 
No marijuana was seized in his first year and a half as sheriff because Hayes did not even allow the state drug task force to operate in Bacon County. In recent years, he redeputized the state task force and they've eradicated some major plots. But as long as marijuana money is important to the local economy, as long as it buys farm equipment and pays off bank loans, there is no pressure on Bucky Hayes to be a hero. One more thing. Teddy Boatwright, whose plants were found last October, has yet to stand trial. If he is ever tried, it will be in front of a local jury, a jury of his peers. Can you get convicted in front of a jury around here? Yeah, but it's getting harder. Harder and harder to be convicted. Are juries friendly? Yeah. Because they're your neighbors? Yeah. Because they're growing too? Yeah, a lot of them is. Because they need family them? is. Some of the family. They ain't, a, they ain't a whole lot of families that connection somewhere or another down the road in the kinfolk line. But what is connected with it one way or the other? If the government wanted to eradicate all marijuana growing in Bacon County, could they? No. Never. The, the, only, the good thing is, is when you, when they took five or six million dollars worth out of Bacon County, that made the boys over in Pierce County sure enough proud. Supply and demand. Theirs just went up. It's absolutely right that we must educate our children not to do drugs, including alcohol and tobacco. But that's an obvious policy. We've also learned that marijuana is no longer simply associated with the so-called drug culture. And like it or not, marijuana, marijuana for profit, now has roots in mainstream America. This leads inevitably to a discussion about legalization or tougher laws. That debate is intensifying. What people need to understand is that the current effort to eradicate growing here at home isn't changing things very much except to ensure that the price stays high. Really getting at the people who grow marijuana no longer means closing the borders, but an enormously expensive invasive door-to-door -door campaign. Which brings us back to that former deputy sheriff in Bacon County. He reminded us that you can only police the people as much as they are willing to be policed. And how much is that? I'm Peter Jennings. Thank you for joining us. Good night. video cassette or transcript of Peter Jennings reporting. Call 1-800-913-3434. This has been a special presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news.